Our sermon text for this morning comes from 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And let's read that together. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In this morning's passage, Peter is addressing Christians. And as Christians, we should take note of this. In verses 9 and 10, we read that Christians are a chosen race. They are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. And for this reason, Christians are, are beneficiaries of God's mercy. They receive God's mercy. You receive God's mercy. All these titles and benefits are granted to them through the faith that has been worked in them and unites them with Jesus Christ. And in this, we notice an expression of, of God's love and his grace. And the address, the address beloved, reflects this reality. And Christians are, are also citizens of God's kingdom. And their allegiance has been, has been claimed by him. So Peter rightly call, calls God's beloved sojourners and exiles. They are, they are pilgrims on earth. This is a reminder to Christians that their journey on earth is, is but a, a temporary journey. And that one day they will be restored to their, their promised eternal dwelling place, which is in the, the presence of God. It would be good for us to keep in mind that this applies to God's people of all times and ages. It was the case for, for Abraham in the Old Testament. It was the case for, for the Christians in Asia Minor, who Peter is writing to. And it is still the case for us here today. And let us consider the earthly journey for the Christians in Asia Minor. They are just a, a few decades removed from Jesus walking the earth. The Holy Spirit has been, has been poured out at Pentecost. And Christianity is, is evidently spreading across the world. And with this ongoing transformation on earth, there is also an increased frustration toward those who believe in Jesus. Christians are, are facing many spiritual pressures, internally and externally. Internally, as, as their life was to be dedicated to battling sin, and externally, as their lives were, were in full view of the world around them. The Christian life is and was to be a testimony to God's transforming work in the covenant child. And this testimony is intended to bring others to the feet of Jesus. With this in mind, I present the living word to you this morning under this theme, our theme this morning. Peter urges the beloved to live as God's people. And we'll look at Two points. First, for their own salvation. And secondly, for, for the salvation of others. 
Look at our first point then, for their own salvation. Peter, having explained to the Christians who God has declared them to be, Peter now sees it necessary to exhort or, or preach to them about their walk of life. And the first of these exhortations we, we find in verse 11, where we read once again, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. This is the, the first item that Peter urges the Christians to do, to abstain, to refrain, to, to distance themselves from the passions of the flesh. And what does, what does Peter mean when he says passions of the flesh? Although Peter does not explicitly mention at this moment what he's referring to, later on in, in chapter 4, he provides us with an idea of what he has in mind. In chapter 4, verse 3, Peter writes about what the Gentiles, what the Gentiles want to do. And the Gentiles, they want to go about living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry, passions of the flesh. It is obvious that these lifestyles directly contrast the life that Peter mentions in chapter 1, where in verse 13, he told the Christians to, to prepare their minds for action and to be sober-minded and to set their hope fully, not partially, but fully on the grace that will be brought to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Peter goes on to write why, why they must abstain from the passions of the flesh. This is because they wage war against the soul. Beloved, every, every war has two sides. And in this war against the believer's soul, on the one side, we have the kingdom of light, where Christ is king and the covenant child has been drafted. And on the other side, we have the kingdom of darkness, where we must contend with our own sinful desires and inclinations. Now this may cause us to pause and think, has not the battle been won? Christ has died. He is risen. Has he not claimed victory for us? And yes, yes, he most certainly has. And those who believe, we, we are certain of his victory. And we live in his victory. However, however in, the, in the aftermath of, of wars, even once one side is victorious. There are still battles that go on. Using, using World War II as an illustration, towards the end of the war, the, the German high command, the Nazi leadership, refused to accept defeat. And for months, for months, the, the war dragged on, claiming many lives from both sides. Even though there was, there was no way Victory could be attainable for the Nazis. They refused to surrender. So too, the sinful desires of our flesh, they can trench in, refusing to surrender and trying desperately to gain possession of our soul. And this may leave us discouraged, it forces us to accept that as, as sojourners and exiles here on earth, the dangers, they are still present. Yet, be encouraged, dear pilgrims. God does not leave our souls unattended. No, he, he faithfully equips us for the battle. In Ephesians chapter 6, which we read together, Paul reminds the believer of the armor that God provides his soldiers. 
And this armor, it is for all God's people. And that includes you as well, boys and girls. You too are a soldier in the Lord's army. So you too receive God's armor. You are given the armor. This armor, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, Helmet of salvation and the others is the reason we are able to withstand the schemes of the devil and our sinful desires that try to deceive us. As we can imagine, God does not leave his people on the battlefield, battlefield unattended. No, not at all. He, he provides us with an ample defensive arsenal. We are fully equipped by God to defend our souls from the enemy. Let us then not, not live as those who do not have the armor. As God's children, we are called to, and we read this in, in verse 9, we are called to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Sadly, it can happen that those who are, who are fully equipped with the armor of God, become arrogant, proud, complacent, and decide not to use what God has provided. The, the flaming darts come, but they do not raise their shield in defense. In fact, some may actively position themselves in, in harm's way, inviting the blows of the enemy upon the body. And after a while, the damage becomes great. And it may happen that those, that, that they no longer will desire to proclaim those ex excellencies, the excellencies of King, J J King Jesus, as vibrant as they once did. And eventually, th those, joyful, those joyful shouts of, I am free, I am free through him who ransomed me. I am free through Jesus, who ransomed me, will become cries of despair as they find themselves enslaved by the enemy. If this is where any of us find ourselves this morning, dear pilgrims, dear children of God, enslaved by the passions of the flesh, and darkness filling our heart, broken by our own pride. Pray for deliverance. Repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness. Ask your King, Jesus Christ, to rescue you on the battlefield. If you find yourself greatly wounded because you have engaged in sensuality, mindfully allowing your eyes to look where they ought not, reading literature that causes the heart to wander far from God in order to satisfy the passions of, of the flesh, or struggling with, with same-sex attraction. If you find yourself greatly wounded having become enslaved to alcohol, where your desire for a drink has become much more than just casual. Christian, cry out to him for help. If you are lost in the darkness of sin, cry out to him for help. He will hear our cry. Humble yourself into, into his protection into his protection and care. He knows the battlefield well. He walked this earth himself in perfect obedience. Ask him to, to penetrate the darkness of your heart with his radiant light. That he may create a desire within you to do his will. That you may be willing to profess his, his goodness and exalt his name among the nations. And that you may bear fruits of thankfulness before him. 
Pray that your king may equip you with his word and spirit, that you may actively battle sin, actively battle the passions of the flesh. Brothers and sisters, in the, in the first chapter of First Peter, our Lord directs us not to be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Our Lord warns us that human ignorance leads to conformity to the passions of the flesh. This is why we pray for, for our wills to be transformed more and more to God's will. And that as a result, our conduct, our actions, may demonstrate God's mercy. And his mercy in our lives ought to be, ought to be visible for all to see. And this will lead us to our second point. Peter urges the beloved to, to live as God's people for the salvation of others. In our, in our second point and exhortation, Peter issues another command towards Christians. But now it is, it is centered on how his people visibly behave in the world. Having placed the importance in the first exhortation on the, on the believer's eternal well-being, Peter transitions to how the believer's actions may, may reflect this well-being. He writes in, in verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. And the identity, the identity of the Gentiles should be considered as those who do not yet desire to do God's will. Those yet living in their ignorance. And among such people we are to behave honorably. The Christian, having been transformed, the Christian's reason for behaving honorably has changed. We do not behave honorably simply to, to garner respect in the communities in which we live, but rather to proclaim God's excellencies through our good deeds. That is the main purpose. It is an act of, of beautiful obedience to the king. And why is it that Peter commands the Christians to behave in a way that proclaims God's excellencies? Because, as we re read on, so that when they, the Gentiles, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds. They may see your good deeds. Dear Christians, Peter knows that the world is watching. Whether it be the, the, the church at large or whether it be individual believers, the world is watching. That is why the believer's behavior is, is so important. Because we are not representing just ourselves, but also the King, Jesus Christ. Who has claimed us. And as a, as a way of, of illustration, we could think of our, our Canadian, South African, or, or Australian citizenship. Citizens that, that travel to another country, such as, such as Canada to Korea, Australia to Canada, or South Africa to Canada. Those who travel may be observed by the locals of those countries. And after some time, the locals may, may likely form perceptions of the country we come from by how we behave. If we behave poorly, the country we come from may be thought of us in a, in a poor manner. If we are well-behaved, the country we come from may be well thought of among the, the locals. 
And so, too, a similar scenario can happen with the outward behavior of the believer. How the professed Christian behaves on earth speaks volumes to the world. Now, knowing this, we must be somewhat careful. Often, often our impulse is to make sure that the world does not speak poorly of us or, or Jesus. And this fear of being spoken poorly of can, can cause us to compromise in some way. For example, what would we do if an acquaintance, or we can even say a friend, invites us over to, to watch a show or a movie, and there is blasphemy or nudity or excessive and unwarranted violence in the show? Would we sit through it and not utter a word? Or would we speak up and stand up and leave if necessary? Going through, through such a scenario, may, scenario may, may leave us concerned with what our friend or acquaintance may, may think, of or, think or, or say about us. Let us then not overlook the phrase, when they speak against you as evildoers. It is not a matter of if they will speak against us, but when. When they speak against you as evildoers. It is inevitable. It is not uncommon for, for his faithful church to be on the receiving end of verbal attacks from groups such as the LGBTQ community or pro-abortion community. Those living in ignorance will always speak in opposition against the faithful church, slandering Christ's bride. So we should not be shocked when confronted by slanders. Remember God's rebuke towards the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. I will put enmity between your offspring and her offspring. And this enmity has remained in the world from that point onwards. It even brought about the death of Jesus Christ, sealing the victory for all believers. As God's children, then, it is, is an important, it is important for us to turn back to the command. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that we can be reminded that we are called to what is, what is honorable in God's eyes. There is no room for a compromise. It is a battle of the wills. God's will versus our own will. And we pray to be conformed to God's will. And since the Gentiles or, or, or unbelievers act in their ignorance by speaking against Christians, there's ever more of a significance for the believer to do good deeds. As Peter explains in, in verse 15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. And also in chapter 3, verse 16, where Peter writes, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. The hope is, beloved, that the more and more good deeds that are done out of true faith by the believer, that this will eventually be noticed by the unbeliever. God may use these good deeds these good deeds, the pure conduct, the pure conduct of the believer to bring the unbeliever into his kingdom. And we notice, and we notice the, the, the hope of such a transformation in chapter 3, verse 1, where the scriptures mention that the, that the believing wife may win her husband over without a word. And in verse 2, we read that this this may happen, 
by her husband seeing her respectful and pure conduct. Without a word, beloved. What wonders the Holy Spirit can do. God may, may cause an unbeliever to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from their, from their noticing of or looking upon the good deeds of his people, the conduct of his people. He may cause an unbeliever to be born again by looking upon your deeds. And it may happen that, that the former unbeliever who would now believe would be united to Christ, claimed by him, and it would be, and he would be or she would be given the name Christian. And the newly converted Christian would, would glorify God. It would be, without a doubt, a miracle. Such transformations are a miracle. And let's reflect upon our own current surroundings. Here we are as, as God's covenant people, living in and around the city of Hamilton. Are we visible in this community? Are there opportunities for unbelievers to look upon the good deeds of us as believers? Do we volunteer our time? And are we visibly present during the times of community crisis? When a coworker is having a rough day, do we physically and, and visibly come beside them? Or do we go about our own business? Business owners, do we operate with integrity that reflects a godly person? Children, when you are when you are playing at the local parks or at the beach, are you kind to the other boys and girls? There are so many other examples and scenarios that can be listed. Are we aware of the potential impact of our actions? Let us take this exhortation by God seriously and be diligent in our walk of life, so that if the Lord wills it, one day, one day we may be able to call our, our workplace friend, brother or sister in Christ. Or that neighbor that we chat with from time to time, brother or sister in Christ. Fellow pilgrims on this earth, walking in Christ, following him. In both of these exhortations this morning, abstaining from the passions of the flesh and the command to keep our conduct among the Gentiles honorable, we notice God's, God's mercy and love. In verse 11, Peter is concerned about, about the salvation of the believer. God is concerned about the salvation of the believer. And in verse 12, he is, he is concerned about the salvation of the, of the unbeliever. And this is an incredible reminder that our God cares for and sustains and governs all souls on earth. And he continues to gather all his elect to himself in preparation for the day of visitation, which we notice at the end of verse 12 so that all those who repent may glorify Jesus on that day when Christ returns. But we also witness his justice. For this is the reason Peter writes in verse 11, I urge you, I urge you, because what follows concerns not only salvation, but judgment. So there is a need 
a need for urgency. We on earth do not know when the bridegroom will appear to claim his bride, nor do we know when we ourselves will die. Beloved of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as Christians living temporarily on earth, do we truly love our neighbor as God does? Instinctively, we, we nod our heads, and we nod our heads, yes, yes, I do. I love my neighbor. Well then, as we, as we leave this church today, with our allegiance firmly established in Jesus Christ, let us, in the, in the week ahead, surrender ourselves to these exhortations from the living word. We ought to ask God to help us be particularly aware of our actions because those unconvinced may be watching us. In this, we should rejoice because when they see, when they see our good deeds, they may come to know of the love of God. And when that moment comes, when Jesus Christ, the good king, makes his, his incredible return, and if it is his good pleasure, we may share with those we love, whether it be that, that coworker or that neighborhood friend, we may share with those we love the opportunity to glorify and exalt him on that day together. May it be our prayer that this is indeed the case. Amen.